Um, I'm not sure whether you are all aware, because quite, quite a lot of Australians aren't aware, that macadamias um, evolved and are uh, an Australian native plant. They um, evolved in a small uh, coastal part of Queensland, which you'll see on the map shortly. And um, in around uh, the 1850s, um, it was a, a collection of um, about 1,500 macadamia nuts taken from underneath one tree in a place called, or near a place called Mulu, west of Gympie. These nuts were taken to Hawaii and in Hawaii they were germinated and um, monitored for their performance in terms of um, qualities of the nuts that were produced by these first seedlings planted in Hawaii and over a period of about 50 years certain selections were made all genetically related to this one tree and that selection of uh, varieties as it were or cultivars forms the basis of the world macadamia commercial industry so um, a lot of people in the world believe that macadamia nuts came from Hawaii it's not the case at all so um, anyhow John uh, here we are uh, you can see this small area in red the red circle um, northern New South Wales um, and as far north as a sort of little bit northwest of Jinjin, a place called Bulburin. And that's the area where the four species of macadamias evolved and can be found in small wild populations to this day in rainforest and margins of rainforest in that area. Um, macadamias have been taken and planted all over the world in many countries. Um, in cities in the south of Australia, you can see them growing in Adelaide, Melbourne. Um, they're frost tender, they don't like uh, um, wet feet, they are like a well-drained situation. And they can't tolerate uh, um, super dry heat or arid conditions. But they will withstand tropical conditions to a point. Um, optimally, they grow in that small margin. Have the next one, John. Um, I told you that I would be talking about conserving um, the, the wild populations of macadamias that exist, and these are the reasons. Um, they are nominated now as a rare and threatened species, um, and that that um, that is no mean feat. I think um, you see. Uh, hundreds of thousands of macadamia trees growing in rows around Bundaberg, um, Sunshine Coast, northern New South Wales and spreading south um, from there and in places like South Africa where they have many, many more trees planted than we do in Australia. But these are of a very narrow range of um, species, um, predominantly one species um, out of four and um, this is what we call integrifolia. So um, the other three species um, which contain genetic matter which may be useful for plant breeding and other reasons in the future um, are very much threatened and I'll explain a little bit more later how they are threatened and why. Um, they're a treasured ancient and modern food. Um, uh, the earliest um, indigenous people in Australia would migrate from one place to the next in search of what was currently available according to seasons. For example, bunion nuts in one time of the year, then onto the coast for some shellfish or tailor, which, which might have been easy to catch in some um, coastal areas. Um, then macadamias in, um, I guess, from sort of April, May, June, at the peak of their fruiting. And so, um, subsequent to European people discovering macadamias um, and exploiting them for a food product, they've become very, very popular because they've got some wonderful health attributes. They're about 70% oil, 
um, by volume and uh, the oil is predominantly monounsaturated oil which is the desirable oil um, to help uh, dissolve all of our cholesterol. Um, there are other magic ingredients, micronutrients and fibres and protein in macadamia nuts. And so it's a wonderful um, healthy food product. Um, they are very high in calories as well, so they can, and that explains my slight paunch. Um, so uh, vitamin E and tocopherols and other antioxidants are also um, you know, pretty uh, important components. Um, compared with other tree nuts, and I think all tree nuts are good for you, macadamia is the, the highest in oil content. So macadamia is around 70% oil. Just for a comparison, almonds um, around 50%. So it's a very oily nut. And that has some useful, uh, well, it has some beneficial things. Um, it's, uh, it, it can um, degrade uh, or go rancid if it's not stored correctly. So when macadamias are dried um, and um, you want to store them for any length of time, the best thing to do is put them in an airtight container, generally in a dark place, and refrigerate. And you can, you can make them last <clears throat> three to five years. If you don't do that, you'll get rancidity happening and the flavours will become off and they can ultimately become poisonous. Uh, next one, please, John. Currently, um, you can see the statistics here. Macadamias are grown in at least 10 other countries, predominant, predominantly South Africa. More trees there, as I said, than there are in Australia in a commercial situation. Um, global production in 2020 was um, 227,000 tonnes. Um, Australian production uh, this year, 50,000 tonnes. You can see we're a small part of it. China has been planting macadamia trees um, willy-nilly for years and um, although the statistics are sketchy there, um, I think they'll probably supersede um, South Africa before too long. So out of that, uh, macadamias provide um, many thousands of people with employment and sustenance. Um, we are in Australia the genetic um, guardians of genetic diversity which means, uh, and I'll hark back to this again, as I said, um, we have a responsibility to look after um, and conserve the wild stands of macadamia trees that exist in various places. Um, and uh, Australia, Australian subtropical forests are a living gene bank for crop improvement and disease resistance. This means that um, as I said, all the commercial trees um, hail from one mother tree near Mulu. And although they, have, they are diverse in that their progeny have, um, uh, have some diverse characteristics, it's still a fairly narrow genetic band. And um, from the wild populations, uh, we in the Conservation Trust believe, well we know, that um, there's um, unlimited potential for um, as yet undiscovered uh, beneficial or or not not beneficial traits um, so we're looking for we what we've done is we've mapped the genome for macadamias um, and we're able to uh, take samples of DNA from macadamia trees and identify specific markers that which relate to the specific characteristics of the plant for instance um, it's very desirable for a if you're growing macadamias commercially, to select some that have a, a thin shell and a large kernel so that you maximise your production of the valuable uh, nut meat in the middle. Um, many of the wild trees have a very thick shell and a tiny kernel, but in saying that, they may have a very good tree structure which might be resistant to wind or storm damage. So if put into a commercial situation, that can be a great benefit. So by understanding these genetic markers, we can then undertake plant breeding and produce uh, better and better uh, trees for production. 
another factor is that, um, uh, and I, I think we, we all will acknowledge now that climate change is a real thing. Um, we've noticed in, in uh, macadamia commercial production that a very subtle, a uh, very small um, change in diurnal temperature variation, that is the maximum daylight temperature versus the coolest temperature at night, so the variation between those two temperature readings um, is diminishing. In other words, it's, it's becoming more mild. And if we look at um, most uh, plants, um, um, by necessity, in order to produce hormones that make them reproductive, need some variation and sometimes very specific variation in diurnal temperature to, uh, to become reproductive, in other words, to flower and produce fruit. So with this subtle change, um, the varieties that we're currently using, selected from the Hawaiian ones, taken originally from one tree in Gimpy, um, they are um, being impacted subtly by this. Um, we've discovered that there is a, a species of macadamias, albeit with unedible nuts, that evolved northwest of Jinjin in the place called Bulburin, which I mentioned earlier, where climatic conditions are much warmer and drier than they are in the other, uh, other regions where the other species have evolved. So we believe that there's great potential um, look, using genetic matter from that species. Um, next, please. So um, the habitat is important for macadamias. That is the, the areas in which they um, grow naturally. Um, it's always within 60 kilometres of the east coast of Australia, generally in creek valleys. And um, the way they disperse is um, get a flush of rain like, and nuts fall on the ground and are washed downstream and then they've spread into um, margin, marg rainforest margins generally around creek banks. Next, please. So there are four species. Um, I mentioned Macadamia jansenii. This is recently discovered, and when I say that, about 20 years ago, discovered in the Bulburin area, northwest of Jinjin. Um, it's uh, a small spreading Macadamia tree with small leaves and very tiny nuts. It's, the nuts are not edible. But this is the species that I mentioned may be very useful in plant breeding because it evolved in a much hotter and drier climate. Integrifolia, oh, this one's critically dangerous. There are only very few um, um, specimens left in the wild. Um, Integrifolia, this is the variety that's mainly used for commercial production and it's the one that evolved in southeast Queensland um, down to um, almost to the, or the border ranges. Um, and in the um, creek valleys leading up into the back behind Gympie. It's the um, species that the nuts were taken from to, to, to Hawaii, which I mentioned earlier. And um, it's vulnerable because the habitat in which it occurs naturally is threatened. And I'll explain uh, with more detail about that shortly. Turnifolia, um, another um, small, um, small growing tree with very small nuts and again, not edible. Um, it's evolved around the Sunshine Coast region, um, out to Walvai on the um, Kalula Coast and up around Noosa. You might find some here and there um, around Budrum and definitely up um, behind Nambour um, going up towards Montville in some rainforest remnants, you can find Turnifolia. Um, not edible but um, possibly useful for plant breeding and, um, and important in that, for that reason. Tetraphylla, um, this is the one that evolved um, south of the border ranges. Um, it's around northern rivers of New South Wales. It is edible, um, it's delicious, and um, I'll show you that um, you can see some visual differences in these um, uh, variety uh, species um, in the next slide. Um, is everybody hearing me okay? Yes. Good. Okay, so um, the tetraphylla, so-called because of the 
four leaves in each whorl. On the, on the stem of a macadamia tree, leaves, leaves are born on what we call whorls. So around the stem, with a tetraphylla, tetra meaning four, there are four leaves. Um, however, sometimes there aren't. <laughs> there are aberrations in nature, as we all know. One of the characteristics is that the new flush is quite distinctly pink or red and quite spectacular. Likewise, the flowers can be pink and quite beautiful. Um, the leaves are very serrated. In fact, so serrated that they, they can rip the skin off you. Um, um, the nuts have um, more natural sugar in them. So when you roast them, uh, that caramelizes and they tend to um, have a, a brownish or golden color, um, which for some reason in the market is not as desirable as a creamy white nut which is produced by the um, Integra Folio, and we'll talk about that next. Um, one of the um, things that's been useful about the tetraphylla, other than, because it's not commonly grown uh, as, a, as a food product, um, it's used as a, as a rootstock. Um, it has a tendency to be um, less prone to um, pathogens, um, soil, when waterborne diseases in the ground. So it's been used as a rootstock, it's got vigour. And um, uh, so that's been uh, one of its main uses commercially. Uh, can I have the next slide? This is Integrifolia, the one on which um, all of the industry is based. And this is Ian McConaughey, um, one of the, I was gonna say grandfather, but I'm almost a grandfather in the industry as well. But Ian's um, one of the longest surviving, um, earliest members in the Macadamia Society. This is a picture of the Mulu tree from which those nuts that went to Hawaii came from. And that's still standing on private land. Um, and um, that's quite big for a Macadamia tree. Um, uh, Integrifolia um, com um, generally have um, this creamy white racine, the flower. Um, and the leaves are much less serrated. There are usually three to a whorl. And if there's any, any um, uh, confusion telling the difference between tetraphylla and integrifolia, integrifolia leaves always have a dominant petiole, the leaf stem. Um, tetraphyllas don't. It's like people with earlobes and people without earlobes. Um, next, please. Okay, Turnifolia, this is the little one that's evolved around um, Noosa, some around uh, Hinterland behind Nambour, um, and out to Walvoi. Um, typically uh, sm very small leaves, um, pinkish tips, um, pink or white flowers, um, quite prickly. Um, no dominant trunk, it tends to branch and um, the nuts are tiny. Next one please. Last of all is the Janssen eye, the one that evolved at around Bulburin, northwest of Jinjin. Tiny nuts, uh, probably those nuts big as my, the fingernail on my small finger. Um, leaves are smooth, um, three, three per whorl, like the other three species. And um, the flowers vary a bit in, uh, in colour, but, um, and the new flush is a coppery colour. There's a 10 cent piece so you can see Okay, next please. Ah, where can you see these four species? Um, the first one uh, predominantly, we, um, this is a little out of date, but Tondoon Botanical Gardens in Gladstone is where you'll see most. But if you go to Lake MacDonald, Croy, um, Noosa Botanical Gardens, there are um, some there, and it's my plan to have some more of them scattered around in the Marucci shot. Re regional council, um, Sunshine Coast Regional Council area um, before too long. Integrifolia, um, if you look on your chair, you may see a small uh, green brochure, um, which uh, is, uh, describes um, a project that the Macadamia Conservation Trust has just completed. And this is a place called Amamar day use area in the Amamore Valley. 
west of Gimby. Um, it's here that we've found a po wild population of Entegrifolia and there's a, um, usefully there's a national park little track there. So we've just installed some signage and some interactive uh, information material there so that it, if you're going for a drive up that way sometime it's well worth a stop. It's a short walk and you'll see some wild macadamias there and you'll get the chance to um, find some yourself. It's quite a pleasant little rainforest walk ending up um, uh, with some cascading water. Um, and so on the uh, green brochure that'll give you more information about that. It's not officially open yet um, because of the rain we haven't been able to get the appropriate minister or somebody to come up and cut the ribbon as it were. But that'll happen in very, very soon. Um, the turning foliar you, you can see um, at Creek, I don't know if it, you people know what Creek is, it's an it's a, uh, environmental centre near Caboolture. Um, underrated, um, not widely known. It's situated on, um, on the Burpengary Creek and that's where um, Turner Folias can be found um, in their natural state as well. Um, tetrafillers um, in the Numanbar Valley or um, quite commonly in rainforest remnants around northern New South Wales. So um, these, these are the botanic gardens where you can see them all. And as I, oh, Noosa, okay, it is there. Yeah. Um, next, please. So um, I mentioned that um, the habitat of macadamias is, is threatened. Um, this tree here, um, we discovered on a roadside uh, in the Amamore Valley, um, covered in, <coughs> um, Madeira vine and cat's claw. Are you familiar with these dreadful scourges? Um, and um, this is Jan McConaughey and that's myself. We put all that down. This tree we believe is probably 300 years old. Um, there's no real way of, um, um, it's, it's difficult to carbon date things that are, that are less than 500 years old. Um, and there are, there are some new methods for dating um, uh, growing plants. One of, the, one of the problems with macadamias is if you saw it down, it doesn't have age rings like many other plant species. So it's indeterminate. Um, I've known, I'm, I know of some trees growing in rainforest places that I saw and photographed 40 years ago that high, as thick as my finger. They're still that size, 40 years later. I don't know how long that small tree would have been there. And um, the reason it's not changing or growing is because it's in a rainforest situation. There's a dense canopy and it's got lots of competition from other plants around it. But I dare say if there's a storm event or something and a, you know, a gap in the canopy is created, more light comes in um, um, and, and it'll start growing. So we just don't know how old they are. Um, the, the mother tree at Mulu, um, um, you know, it could be 500, 600, we don't know. So this is an example of, um, you know, we, we can't possibly go into the rainforest now um, and clear away cat's claw. Does anybody, everybody know what cat's claw is? It's, it's the most dreadful imported um, plant from South America. Um, I'll, I'll hand out another brochure shortly. I just, you, you need to be, make yourselves familiar with this. Um, it's actually invading all of the riparian zones from um, the, probably around Grafton in New South Wales on the Clarence River, all the way up to the Herbert River in North Queensland. Slowly but surely, it's a, a vine that's taking over um, trees along um, creek and riverbeds. Um, it's underrated in its um, horrific um, um, outcome if we leave it um, by politicians because it's difficult to control. There have been a number of insect pests uh, liberated to try and control it, but they're ineffectual. Um, this vine grows a, a, a massive bulb under the ground and um, the vine itself climbs the trees very quickly and at each node 
um, a series of thorns that actually dig into the host plant. I mean, it has a beautiful yellow flower, but that's the only, that's the only thing about it. And I guess that's why it came here. Somebody wanted it in their garden. Um, I, I, I believe that it's um, one of the greatest threats to our Australian rainforest on the eastern seaboard. And as I said, underrated. Anyhow, um, so threats to the habitat are clearing, weeds, fire, pests, climate, climate change. Um, urban encroachment around, remember the red circle where macadamias grow? That's where humans like to be as well because it's a pretty nice climate. And we're right in the middle of it, believe it or not, today. But, um, so there's a lot of pressure um, from urban development and um, human um, population uh, on, on suitable macadamia land. Um, next, please, John. Um, the Macadamia Conservation Trust relies on uh, philanthropic donation. Um, I'm not here to ask for money, but um, I'm just saying, <laughs> if, you, if you're interested, if you're supportive, um, um, you know, um, it would be wonderful. Currently, um, we fund all our research um, from uh, some philanthropic donation, which is very generous. Some growers have realised the importance of what we're doing. And um, the other means is that we've um, selected a, a very high performing variety um, and now uh, have ownership of that. And we, and all, all the new plantings, growers are clamouring to get it because it's a very high performer. Um, and we get a, a, a small levy from the sale of every one of the plants called macadamia MCT1. And if you're going to plant a macadamia tree in your yard, it must be grafted. Um, you don't expect to get um, consistent cropping or good um, macadamias from a seedling tree. Um, you, can, you can, you might fluke it. Um, I know of quite a few which are, are pretty good, but um, the variety MCT1, Macadamia Concentra Conservation Trust 1, is probably the pinnacle of um, uh, varieties available today. Um, uh, I think I'm finished and open for questions. Um, I'm, I'm sure I've missed out a whole lot of things, but um, never mind. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Hmm. So how do you know exactly where to put it on a creek bed or how far down? They well, they just um, they don't like um, sort of constant wetness. Um, they like free draining soil. So you can have um, they grow typically in Krasnism soils. It's the red soil that is common in Budrum, which in many instances goes right to a creek bank. So and. Um, what they don't like is water over two atmospheres pressure longer than about 24 hours, they'll die. In other words, if it's heavily saturated for any length of time, they're likely to succumb. So if, you've got a, if you're planting at home and you near the creek, as long as it's not swampy um, and that it dries out and drains relatively freely, um, it should be okay. Well, it depends what you want to do. If, if you want to plant in a rainforest situation and there's only a small window of light above from the canopy, then it'll respond accordingly. It'll just grow tall and have a small canopy. Um, where, where we grow them commercially, we maximise sunlight by planting them in rows, generally facing north-south and trying to get as much light onto the canopy as possible to make the factory work to produce the carbohydrates to produce the fruit. Yes. Yeah, how long from planting and the farmer expected that and which is a crop for harvest? So, well, um, with the newer varieties, such as the one MCT1 I mentioned earlier, um, they're a lot more precocious than the earlier selections and, and um, they can start bearing fruit in, in year three. It, it used to be uh, year six or seven. 
Um, but to be cash flow positive, uh, depending on circumstances, but in general terms, probably seven to eight years. Yes. Yep. Um, and it's probably 15 years old. I get literally thousands, millions of flowers on it, but aren't there any fruit sets? Yeah, the, the, the problem with that is that um, generally there are a number of sort of endemic uh, threats, pests, um, that live on other plants as well. There, there are a couple of things. There's, um, there's a, a thing called the macadamia flower eating caterpillar. <laughs> Pretty self-explanatory. Um, uh, various other pests which will um, get onto the flower. Then if you do get some fruit set, then you, there's something else called the macadamia nut borer, self-explanatory. Um, and then um, there are a range of um, fungal pathogens. There's one called Cercospora, which is part of a huge family of fungi, but um, there's botrytis, which you probably all know about. All those things, if there's, if there's a damp spring, it's like your mango flowers, you might get anthracnose, all those sorts of things. Uh, they affect macadamia flowers just the same. It's a, it's a shame, really. Um, um, you know, it could be the tetraphylla might be a bit out of its territory here. The flowers might be a bit sweeter, more attractive to the insects. Um, it could depend on seasons. And if you've observed the same thing happening year in, year out, it may be that you've got other plants surrounding that host these um, flower caterpillars or whatever it is that's doing the job. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, um, if you've got a bit of rainforest or a bit of natural bush around, you're going to have plenty of that sort of thing. There aren't many um, predatory insects 